again. Welcome. My name is Fatima. I'm a co-founder of Collective 365, a organization committed to celebrating and investing in black and brown communities in DC, Maryland, and Virginia. We are excited to host one of our members, Sean Smith, who comes with a wealth of not only um, knowledge, but experience. And we are just really, really excited that he's going to collaborate with you all to figure out the world of grant writing, because it's a lot. Um, and so without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Sean. Thank you, Fatima. Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome. I'm glad to have you here. So just um, as Fatima said, we're going to talk tonight about grant writing, developing compelling proposals. The way that I present is a little uh, unorthodox sometimes. I am a conversationalist, so I do not like to talk at people. Um, and so we can do this one of two ways. We can start off by, you know, you all proposing what your questions are, and let's see if we can um, answer them that way. Or I can just delve right into the presentation. It's up to you. If you have questions, please feel free to come off mic. If you all are working on proposals and you have those at the front of your mind, please um, bring that information up. That's why we're here. I would love to just sort of triage that with you. Um, that's what the space is here for. If at any time throughout the presentation you have any questions, please feel free to come off mic um, and ask the questions. I do not mind being um, cut off. Sometimes I can go down uh, a dirt road and it's great to be stopped. Um, and yo, welcome, welcome. I'm excited to have you all here. If you can just place in the chat um, what type of work your organizations are doing. So if you're working in the education field, if you are working in mental health, if you are working um, with businesses and developing agricultural farms, I'd just like to uh, see who we have here at the table tonight. So see education, Education, awesome, awesome. Can I ask you a question? Absolutely. All right, so my question is, so I've been told that, okay, so for grants, when you're applying for grants, is it better to pay somebody to write it for you or do it yourself? So I think that's a really good question. And it depends on a variety of things. The first would be the capacity of your organization. If you all, if you have, or your business, if you have the capacity, and I mean that both financially and the social capital to be able to invest in working with a grant writer, then by all means, um, hire a grant writer, especially if you're writing for larger grants like federal grants. Most grant writers who work on federal projects are individuals who either have been funded by them, worked in a grant management capacity, somewhere in um, navigating grants or, or is a certified grant manager. So they have some type of experience, usually writing um, for nonprofits. If you are a business, it's the same thing I would. Um, and they have, they talk a little bit more technical on the business side. So requests for proposals as opposed to requests for applications, which we'll talk about um, in, in the presentation a little bit. And then if you have some of the base knowledge, what I suggest, if you are comfortable writing a grant or if you just don't have the money, work with a grant um, strategist. It may They may not cost as much as someone who is actually writing the grant for you, but they may be able to help guide you and kind of point out what you know, some of the mistakes are or errors or help you develop your strategy a little bit more effectively. So there are different avenues that you can take. Thank you. No problem. Anyone else? I love that. Thank you for just jumping out there. Okay, cool. So sit back, get comfortable. We're just going to have a conversation. All right. Um, I don't want you all to think of, of this as a lecture. Can everyone see my screen? Can you see my screen at all? No. Fatima, yeah, yeah. Yes. you mean screen share if you oh. want You can screen share, sorry. I can? Try it now. Okay, cool. Mm. Mm -hmm. 
sorry, I have to set up the um, the privileges, y'all. In the meantime, while we wait, <laughs> enjoy this commercial break. Um, I wanted to do a redirect in the chat. I just dropped the evaluation link. Um, Collective 365 really appreciates feedback. Like we're all about building transparency and meeting our um, grant applicants needs, our members needs, and just community needs. So if you could take some time and provide feedback of like what went well in this workshop, what didn't go so well, that would be really helpful. I put it in the chat because I know some of you have to leave early. And even if you don't stay for the whole time, just the feedback on what you did um, view or learn would be really, really helpful. And All again, right. friendly reminder, please use the chat and unmute yourself for questions. Sorry, it's um, being difficult. <clears throat> well, while we're waiting, there we go. Um, I have a quick question. This is Doreen Early. I am um, currently on the path to become a certified doula. Um, so my, and I'm totally new to this. So my question around grant writing um, is basically looking like, how do I go back about starting um, the process that would, um, I'm looking for grant funds so I can serve um, a population that can't normally afford doulas who charge, you know, thousands of dollars? Absolutely. Also a good question. Um, so the, the, the question is, how do you go about finding those grants to provide the services for individuals who cannot afford the services at a higher rate, correct? Correct. Okay. So, I mean, it's this, it's, it's really the same thing. It's about, and we'll talk about a little bit later toward the end um, where you can find some of the grants, but um, the federal government partnerships, any type of cor corporate partnerships with um, medical institutions, uh, let's see, you can look at any type of grant and job board, schools maybe good places or universities. So there are various avenues that you can take uh, and look at. And, and many of the grants that a lot of people go after, especially organizations, um, small businesses as they are starting out, these things are forecasted months, sometimes years in advance, um, especially as you get to larger projects or foundations who do this year round. Um, that's another good place to look, private foundations. So there are corporations who have typically philanthropic pillars where they donate to place. It may be maternal health, it may be mental health, it could be education. Um, and those are good spaces to look as well. So most times, nine times out of 10, you have to be invited to apply for those. But some of those uh, invitations really just comes by building a relationship with the grant project or, or program officer. Cool, thank you. No problem. And can we see the screen now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, awesome, I love it. It's just, okay, yeah, perfect. Cool. So a little bit about me. My name is Sean. I am a Black queer humanist. Um, and if you don't know what humanism is, I really encourage you, one, just to, you know, go down a, a deep dive one day and, and look at what humanism um, is. And this is how humanism informs my work. So I believe in building capacity between people and organizations and systems to help solve some of the issues that most plague us in society. That could be violence, that could be poverty, that could be um, any of the isms that we are currently navigating as a people, all solvable issues, right? Sometimes we just have to talk to each other. Um, some things are larger than that as well. I'm an entrepreneur, so I have a strategic management consulting company where I work with organizations in um, helping them develop their grant strategies and also communications and strategic um, planning as well. 
And I am currently working full time as a grant manager with uh, DC government. So I manage a portfolio of about two to $3 million of about 10 victim services organizations throughout uh, DC, Maryland, and Virginia. And I've been in the advocacy and victim services field for about 10 years now. I started out as a um, a victim witness specialist in the court system and then doing internships in various nonprofits, um, working in various capacities in my community when I was younger and, and sitting on advocacy um, and violence prevention boards in high school. So I've been doing this work for quite some time. Um, and I am currently in the space where I'm working on um, community wealth building and capacity building specifically for minority serving um, populations, organizations, and business owners. So what is a grant? I'm sure you've heard a lot of, you know, button up issues, but to me, grant is just a compelling narrative. It's a story. So, you know, it's just written word, digital storytelling, and it's meant to provide economic and social capital to businesses and organizations who are responding to various human needs. Those human needs, again, could be um, stopping hunger. It could be intimate partner violence prevention. It could be um, economic development in Peru, right? There are grants for various uh, projects. You can find them in your local communities. So there are many um, cities that um, promote grant opportunities through their community development offices. Um, there are federal government opportunities that are always forecasted and, and put on various government sites. Uh, and then there are private boards where you can find um, the information. And the reason that I, I gave this definition is because I want people to think of grant writing really as a journaling exercise, right? You are digging really, really, really deep. And if you are of a um, BIPOC, and I, I mean by Black, Indigenous, person of color, so Latina, Latinx, um, however we are identifying through our various preferences these days, you know, we've been telling stories for, for centuries. This is what we do as a people. And so that's all grant writing is really. It's a collection of our stories um, and us being able to develop the, the ability to use that in comparison with the research to develop projects um, and respond to issues within our communities. Right? They're more than just money. They are really collaborative ventures that should involve anyone that would be vicariously impacted if the grant is secure. Who do I mean specifically? I mean your employees in your organizations and your businesses, and then those individuals who are also in the community, because ultimately they're the ones who are either going to become patrons of your services, or you're going to want to solicit their participation to ensure um, that your projects are successful. So those are individuals that should also be engaged in the process from the onset. Um, these are not afterthoughts that we should make, right? These are really collaborative efforts. Collaboration also means extending to other organizations and businesses. I know we live in a very competitive uh, space and time and everyone thinks that, you know, if they get the $10 million, then there's absolutely no opportunity for me to get the $10 million and then my project fails and then the organization crumbles and then I'm gonna be a failure. That's not the case. Um, we're in a space now, and I, I say this as someone who works from a funding perspective, where I am looking for collaborative ventures. I want to see organizations who've been around for 15 years and two years partnering on community-based projects together, because that's really how we sustain the work, and it's really how we get to a space um, where we're making sure that our communities are saturated uh, with resources as opposed to depleted of them. So someone asked this question earlier about um, grant writing and traditionally, yes, grants are outsourced to a grant writer. And typically this grant writer is someone who's held up in an office, they may work remotely, they really engage with the employees outside of like the executive leadership or you're dealing with someone um, with middle management. And I got my little person at a desk here in a silo because that's exactly what happens, right? We think of grants as very sort of protective projects because we're dealing with money. Many times, um, and, and I've operated in spaces where uh, the leadership wants to develop a project, they want to go after the money, 
They write all of these employees in on the grant at various percentages. And then they never tell them what's in the project. They don't tell them how much money the grant is awarded for. Um, and what happens is you end up with a very divested and disinterested um, core of individuals who really are critical to ensuring that your, your grants are going to be successful. If you are um, someone who's writing grants and trying to navigate what the, the grant space looks like, one of the things that's incorporated in these projects, and, and this is whether it is a nonprofit, whether it is a business and you're going after a private entity, but you're going to have to make reporting um, efforts and tell them how successful you are being with the project. What are you doing with their money, right? People want to know because ultimately there's some level of accountability um, when individuals are gifting money, right? Someone has to respond somewhere, whether it's their board, whether it's a group of investors, right? People want to know, are they getting a great return on their investment? And so while grant writers, I highly um, encourage you all to use them, you know, if you have the capacity and the space to, to do so, but also leverage the, the space and the, the talents that you have within your organizations, within the businesses, within the communities um, that you are actually trying to invest in or that you exist and navigate space in, right? Because the individuals that would be impacted uh, are available they're visible, but sometimes we don't ensure that they have real investment in our projects and our program developments. And that's when things start to, to fall apart. They become an afterthought. They live in the distance. They're kind of there, but we don't necessarily really know what's going on. So those are things that we have to think about when we are starting to plan our grants before we even get to the point of writing them, right? Who are we bringing to the table with us? Um, start outlining the projects from the onset before we get into the space where we're trying to make a development plan. Any questions so far at this point? Anything, any challenges you all are experiencing with securing grants, um, with writing the grants, with finding grants? What has been your experiences with grants or uh, private proposals up until this point? If you've applied and not been awarded, if you've gotten grants um, and you don't, you're having challenges managing them, what's going on? Absolutely, Misha. Evening. Um, I think my challenge. Uh, hello. Thank you so much for um, being here tonight and, and sharing your knowledge with us. I think my challenge has been succinctly communicating what we're doing mm. and then also really being able to um, convey the impact of that work in a way that resonates with funders um, because I feel like a lot of what we're doing is more on the softer side quote unquote softer side of skills building we okay. I do a, I, my, I lead a youth empowerment organization called I am we are mm -hmm. um, and so the work I know and I can tell you the stories but you know a lot of what I'm hearing for funders is they want to know how many people are going to have jobs after this and mm -hmm. how many what are the hard skills they're getting and did we hand out com computers and really around this job creation so mm -hmm. I've just been challenged to like how do I let people know that like at least from my perspective it's great to give people a computer and a job but if I don't change their mindset and their hearts mm -hmm. it's for not and that's really where we start a little bit lower down in the intervention than sort of at the mm -hmm. end point where I feel like a lot of funders are telling me that's what they want to hear. Yeah, so that's a really good um, example of a challenge to have. And it's a really good opportunity to have as well, because you're in a space where, um, all right, slight tangent. If you all have applied for any type of proposals before and you have not been awarded the proposal, any funder, I don't care where the money is coming from, they give you the opportunity to do a debrief after. Take advantage of that debrief. Uh, because they tell you exactly where it is that, you know, you may have lost points or uh, a, a stronger proposal may have just looked a little bit better than yours. Take advantage of that because they're telling you what they want to see. So while I think, yes, you know, focus, stay, stay true to your mission, but write the project that they're asking for, right? Because they're telling you exactly how you can get the funding and then weave in 
the the softer pieces right those are what we call the supportive elements to the project those are your your operational goals that's key to the success of the things that they want to see and so the the real piece like you said is being able to develop succinctly a communication plan and a strategy um, to be able to get the messaging across where you can bridge um, both things what i would say is i don't know how much um how many like focus groups or just uh, what your evaluation process looks like for your programs, but that may be a good place to start is to get the stories from the, the participants and the individuals that you're impacting, and then you can build from there. And then that's something, again, I'm more than happy for anyone to offer one-on-one -on -one assistance um, if we, you know, you all want to do a deep dive into your proposals. Does that answer your question? Um, It does, but I, I just, I guess I, I still... I, I think I recently figured out a switch of where I've been talking about, like we, we work with kids that are in high school, but mm -hmm. we train kids, we change, re train recent university graduates to do the work. And I think I had an aha recently that it's a little bit easier for me just to talk about the work that we're doing mm -hmm. with the university students, because then mm -hmm. I can say we hire this many people, we train them. And because they're older, they really get how those soft skills help them. Right. And, and they to the benefits much harder versus the with the younger kids it's a much longer leg before you really can tangibly feel and see some of those impacts and they can really communicate it so at least i don't know if that speaks to what you're saying but that's an aha i had recently in in one of our feedback sessions okay what types of funding where what types of funding sources are you going after where are you finding the funding sources anywhere and everywhere but like you know i'm anything from like you know, I, we're, we work with, with kids in South Africa as well as here locally. So I've done everything from local Prince George's County funding to like U.S. Embassy funding um, and, you know, things like that. Okay. And is the challenge that the funding isn't sustainable? Are these like one-off projects? Are you looking for more sustainable funding? Are you looking for a, a larger pot of funding? What is the um, challenge? We haven't actually won any. We've only won one so far. And I think that speaks to like the relationship building aspect of it. So I think for me, I'm just, and I had, I've reached out before and asked for feedback, but I just am trying to get the conversion to be a little bit higher. But I recognize from one of these other workshops that the conversion rate is low, mm -hmm. but I'm just trying to see what can I do. And from other feedback I've gotten from people to actually get a win, um, and you know, as we're applying and make okay. our, our, our package stronger. Cool. Let's touch base one on one um, offline. And I would love to review some of the proposals you've submitted. And maybe I can sort of give you some insight um, of a direction to head down. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Great. Anyone else? Cool. Let's progress. So yeah, I, like I was talking about, grant writing in silos is basically expensive cars with no engine, right? You don't you don't get anywhere. So it's great to be able to, like Misha said, you know, you have to be able to build the relationships on the front end, especially if you're getting into a space where you are um, more sort of socially competitive proposals. And I mean, like everybody's going after the Bill and Melinda Gates, everyone wants the Googles, the Verizons, right? Because these are um, institutions that are very well known in communities, especially nonprofits and, and small business spaces for their philanthropic work. And so we have to make sure that we are building a space where um, everyone is involved and brought to the table. And within reason, of course, right? Planning. Planning is essential to any aspect of your organizational development, any aspect of um, your grant writing here. I want to make sure that we have that, that I have my notes. Right. So you want to make sure that you do some groundwork before you even start to, to write the grant. Right. The plan doesn't work. Change the plan, but never the goal. And sometimes that's going to happen. You're going to run into spaces where you don't get funded. I remember writing my first business proposal. I was really excited. I spent a lot of time on YouTube learning how to write the proposal um, because I really didn't know where to go for, for resources. It was, it was my first time. And this, this, these are the challenges that I think many minority business owners and, and 
and individuals who run organizations run into um, is that we often don't know where to go for resource sharing. So I'm writing the proposal, learning how to write the proposal at the same time as I'm writing it. And I remember taking it um, to the place, hand delivering it, I think maybe like five minutes before the deadline closed because they had to sign it and, and receive it and you had to get a receipt to say it was in by the, the strict deadline that they set. Um, and I didn't get the, the money. I didn't win the proposal. I came in second. I had around the same amount of points as the organization that won, but it was small things like the budgeting that threw me off and, and knocked me out of place for a few points, right? So here are five successful elements that I want you all to consider when you're writing grants, when you're looking for a grant writer. Um, these are things that you all should be considering, right? And that's a vested interest from employees and communities impacted or to be served by the proposed program. Again, the individuals who are gonna be utilizing your services, the individuals who are going to be implementing the projects are critical and essential um, to ensuring that your projects are gonna be successful, right? So you wanna make sure that they are involved from the onset. If you uh, came into the strategic planning and communications workshop that we did last week, I talked a little bit about that as well, making sure that you are communicating internally because your nonverbal communication is just as critical and essential to the things that you say publicly, right? What are you not saying that can also be read? And if you are constantly developing projects and programs and you're not including the community, but then you want them to utilize the services so you can demonstrate impact, right? It kind of falls flat there. So you want to make sure that you are doing the groundwork to build the relationships from the beginning, right? A clearly defined strategy that details who's writing which aspects of the grant. So you have various aspects um, of a grant that you're going to have to write. And so depending on the grant, the money, where it's coming from, it can be as small as 10 pages, it can be lar as large as 20 to 50 pages, depending on what you're writing for, how long the grant proposal is, how much money the grant proposal is worth, what the programmatic requirements um, are going to require as well, right? This is where you sort of determine whether or not you have the capacity to even take on the projects. Um, that's information that they would detail in your RFA, and I'm going to to talk about that in a later slide. You want to make sure that you're alleviating any type of uncertainty that you may have um, at the beginning, right? And when you're pulling everyone in, it leverages the strengths and the talents of talents of your organization. So if you are running with five people and one person may be good with numbers, one person may be good with telling stories. One person may be excellent with editing and reviewing things um, for grammatical content, right? Those are all key people there. And you, you got five people, that's your grant, right? Everybody's taking a piece of the grant. And so when we have to think, again, think about grant writing, come to it in a calm space. It's a conversation. We're just telling a story. Um, and that's all you need. If your person is good with numbers, that's your budget person, right? Anybody can learn Excel. Most Grants come with a template and you're simply just plugging things in, but you're going to need someone who makes sure that they that they are doing the math appropriately. It's one of the main mistakes that I see from grantees when I'm reviewing proposals is that they didn't calculate the percentage of the fringe rate right, or um, they didn't list the fringe rate or the operational costs are in the direct costs. Those are things that you really want to make sure that you're examining and looking through with a, a fine tooth comb. A calendar of important dates and detailed notes on who to contact for your questions, right? Again, these are critical things to undertake before you even get to the grant writing process. And these are essential to the grant writing process. Writing the actual, the grant itself, that's the easy piece because that's a template for you. You're just following the instructions in the template. The piece comes to the making sure you, the strategy aspects, making sure you have all the ducks in the row, right? So um, your pre British conference, these are dates where funders may list uh, what proposals they have coming out or the proposals that they have currently released, how much they're going to be worth, who they plan on awarding them to. For example, my organization just released um, secondary RFAs worth $12 million for housing specific to organizations working with um, LGBTQ identified victims of crime, right? So 
in that solicitation, when we released it, we said, this is the solicitation. This is who it, it, who's eligible to apply for the solicitation. This is how much money the solicitation is going to be for. It could have been awarded to one organization or three organizations, right? All of those details are there. And so those are things that we expect organizations to take notes on. Okay, great. I know that they're going to be doing a Q&A session on the RFA on May 23rd at 12 p.m. That's your calendar. I know the RFA is going to be released three weeks later, right? That means you got a week and a half, two weeks to some extent to be able to at least get some aspect of a, a plan together or project idea if it already hasn't been um, formulated, right? So plenty of time, especially if you're leveraging the talents uh, of the organization. Now, I understand not everyone has a large organization, but Again, when you think of this as a story, you know the work that you're doing in your, your communities. Um, the piece is pulling other people in to help you translate that narrative for you sometimes. If we're in the thick of things, sometimes we are unable, we're looking outside the box and we're unable to focus on what's going on inside the box. And it's really good to have the people who are engaging with us on a daily basis to say what's going on inside the box. <clears throat> Um, your funding and forecasting of solic solicitation dates, again, forecasting, um, and this is very prevalent in the federal government, the federal government on their website, FedBizOps, um, they release uh, every year, sometimes every week, I think every week or two weeks, they update um, what money they plan on releasing, what proposals they plan on releasing. And these are geared towards research institutions. Um, they can be small businesses. You can apply as a primary contractor if you have the capacity to do that. And oftentimes, again, within the um, solicitations, they will detail whether you have to have a certain amount in revenue and to uh, over what time period. So some, for example, may say, you know, you would have had to generate $100,000 in revenue over the course of the last two years and have at least um, two full-time staff, right? Those are things that they list. Um, they tell you when they're releasing it. This may be released six months from now. Sometimes you may have three, up to three years to prepare for certain awards. And, and things like uh, federal awards are a little bit more consistent. So when you get to larger entities, your federal entity, your, um, your foundations and, and private philanthropic institutions, they typically run their application process, their funding, their programmatic things on a calendar. And it's the same thing every year. So those are good things to take note of when you're preparing for your own individual funding and forecasting plans within your businesses and organizations. You know, okay, cool, six months from now, I know Verizon is going to release their Saving the Planet uh, RFP for $500,000. And so these are the things that I need to start planning, right? You want to make sure you have a reasonable cost allocation estimate. What do I mean by that? Have a sound budget or at least some idea of the things that you're, you're going to need, right? Um, if you know by the end of the project that you're going to run out of ballpoint pens, make sure that you're writing that down at the beginning of your budget um, and estimate how many ballpoint pens you're going to need. Um, and then one of the things that you shouldn't be doing with your grant if you are effectively managing um, the money is that at the end of the award, I just saw this, we just closed out the, the FY21 fiscal year. And what many of my grantees like to do is $3,000 worth of supplies in Q4. Why? Why? You knew that those supplies would be needed in Qs one through three, right? Request them at the beginning. Those are things that you um, should budget for. And we have an uh, organization and how we manage things. Organizations have the ability to move dollars around and make grant adjustments throughout the, the process. And many of the funders will allow you to do that as well. So your budget doesn't necessarily have to be 100% um, to the T, right? To the point of how you're going to implement and carry out your project. Project, um, but it should be reasonable in terms of thinking about what you're going to need supply wise, what types of staff effort. If you're going to have to hire anyone, you want to start making hiring plans and looking at what the positions are, making sure that you are paying people a living and equitable wage, right? If you are um, in the DC area, I know, for example, in, in victim services organizations are famous for this, you know, 35, 40 to $40,000 is not 
um, an equitable and, and reasonable living wage for someone living in the District of Columbia. It's just not, you can't survive off of it, right? Um, you're writing grants. So make sure that when you write your grant, your people who are going to implement these grants, again, I'm going to say that time and time again, right? Those people are at the front of your mind. If you're writing the grant, I would rather have a bloated grant to ensure that the employees are being paid an equitable wage, as opposed to over-investing in programs that aren't going to be sustainable in the long run. Um, so those are the things that I'm examining as a funder, right? Does this budget match what the capacity is of the organization to be able to effectively carry out this project? Have they done the necessary homework to build the partnerships um, below? And this is organizationally. If you're a business, right, I want to know what your standing is in the community. What experience do you have um, in doing this? If you are just starting out, have you done your homework? Do you know what your market um, base looks like, right? I need to have information um, to go off of to make sure that people aren't just getting money, you know, give them $300,000 and then they're leaving $150,000 on the table. And it's like, I can't reuse the dollars, right? So those are the things that funders um, want to make sure are going to be avoidable. And finally, a development implementation plan. I cannot express how many times I have worked on a grant project um, and there was no strategic plan or real implementation plan put in place. And, and this is something, again, from the onset. And I told this story in the communication strategic planning workshop, but I worked at a, a large nonprofit in Maryland. Um, and I had a supervisor at the time who wanted to apply for funding through one of the larger foundations there. They had funded some other projects in the organization. So she gave me the proposal to review because I was the, the manager. I said, sure, I review the proposal. I review the proposal, take my notes. And then I go back to her and I said, this project is not going to be funded because you know, we need to change this. We didn't consider this. Um, these are the factors that are going to sort of, you know, prevent us from being able to get this award. It was a community-based project, and we hadn't talked to the community. We didn't even see if the community wanted it. We were basically developing the project and then going into the community and saying, hey, we got money to do this. Why don't you all come on board and then make us look good? And that's just not how things should be working. Um, and, and communities these days are very hip to that. They are, they're very um, insightful when it comes to the type of uh, engagement that the organizations and businesses in their communities are providing to the people that live there. And so you won't get the buy-in. You will not get the buy-in. Um, and so we ended up completing the proposal, sent the proposal in to the funder. And what happens? Funder comes back and they say, we're not going to fund this because you didn't do X, Y, and Z. And it was literally a list of the things that I told her prior to, to submitting the plan. So making sure that you have a very sound development and implementation plan. And again, at this stage, when you're writing, when you're researching and looking for the funding, it doesn't have to be 100% um, correct because you may make adjustments based on what the funder decides to put in your RFA um, or their RFA. Um, but make sure that you have some sort of idea and you can consider like the external factors that you're going to need to make sure that your your project is successful and I'll always tell grantees uh under promise over deliver that does not mean that you can't be innovative and I'll give you an example I recently had a grantee who decided to pay for a victim's driver's license they or they had to go to driver's school I loved it those are things that we're helping to develop self-sufficiency. We're not telling victims what to do with the money. We're making sure that we are providing an intentional resource that's going to um, now be able to help the victim go and get a job and grocery shop on their own and, and get to a space where they are now re reclaiming some aspects of normalcy in their life again. Those are the things that I want to look for when I'm approving grants, you know. That simple, I know that can be accomplished. Um, it's not going to be overly um, extravagant and expensive, and it's directly helping um, to complete the project. So when you think about what it is that you want to plan and, and how you plan on implementing your projects, make sure that you are not going, you know, above and beyond and you don't have the resources, you don't have the staff. Always, always, always under promise, over deliver, but make sure that you're telling the, the compelling story in between and that's what helps you win the money. So what's an RFA? Uh, any questions at this point? I'm sorry. Great. 
Okay, so RFAs, right? Your request for applications. This is pretty much your table of contents. It is your Bible for grant writing, right? It's also an opportunity for you to start planning your project. When you get that RFA, when you see the RFA, really when you see the solicitation request, um, sometimes they don't, they don't release solicitation announcements. Sometimes it's only just the RFA, depending on where you are. Um, and, and what type of project that you are looking to get funded. But your RFA really is your, your table of contents and that's your Bible. It tells you everything that they're looking for in the grant. It tells you the types of proposals. It tells you the elements that they're looking for. Some are very specific. If you, again, are working in federal, um, with federal funding entities, they're very specific about the formatting. So they want it, if they say, they say one inch margins, 12 point times new Roman font, single or double space. That's exactly what they mean. If you go in and it's 14 point font and a one and a half inch margin, they don't read the proposal or they may deny it outright or they may read it and then deny it. Right. So either way, make sure that you are really combing through your your RFA. If you are a private entity, sometimes they're called RFPs or requests for proposals um, where you may be writing to say how you're going to carry out a particular work project. If, if you're in construction, this is something that comes up a lot. Right. When you're bidding um, for contracts and doing private work and consulting work, can be requests for proposals as well. Again, read, reread. Read it again just to make sure, right? When you are, when I was writing my proposal for my business, um, I think I went over it no less than 20 times, right? Three o'clock in the morning, I'm making sure I'm reading the font. Because again, these are things that they outline. They tell you that your narrative page needs to be on top of the grant summary page, which needs to be three pages away from the budget. And the budget needs to be in an Excel template, right? These are all detailed um, in the RFA. And then just avoid some common mistakes. Again, making sure that your, your budget is sound and you have calculated things. I know even if you are a math whiz, I encourage you highly to use the calculator um, just to make sure, because as uh, my boss says, you know, a lot of people can do math, but they can't do their arithmetic. And so sometimes one plus one um, capture, catches people off guard. Um, you'd be amazed at how many times I'm reviewing an application or reviewing a budget and someone did not add or subtract correctly. And I can tell they're trying to do it, you know, in their hand and not verifying with the calculator. So make sure that you are absolutely sure that you don't have grammatical errors, that you've adhered to the font and branding and formatting principles that any of the solicitations are requesting. Make sure that your budget is sound. Make sure that your work plans and your project proposals actually are sustainable um, and make sense. And that's another thing is that um, funders really want to make sure that your projects are sustainable. They don't necessarily have to be the one that funds it, but if I'm starting out something, I want to see how the, the baby grows, right? So um, one-off projects are good, but I would suggest, you know, finding low barrier grants um, to support your one-off projects. If you're going and looking for something more long-term, find larger grants, go out, take the risk. Um, even if you don't get the award, again, do the um, after assessment to find out where you can approve. Can I jump in for a second? Sure. Um, in talking about reviewing the application, um, sometimes if you're like me, you might start making up words that aren't there because you've read the application so many times. Um, and so I, in the chat, I wrote this, but I thought it was important to share for those who are listening to the recording. If you can't afford a grant writer, or if you would prefer not to use one, use friends and family or those people who you hit up and you're like, hey, can you donate to my business? Or, hey, can you donate to my nonprofit? And they're like, oh, I don't have any money, like, but I would love to support you. Cash in on that. Okay, you don't have money, but you have eyes and you're educated. So I would like you to read this, mm -hmm. um, especially if they're not like involved. So like, I, yes, you can have like your part, your business partner um, review it, but having an outside eye, outside eyes on it can be helpful um, and ask them to like review the RFP and like make sure that as somebody that doesn't have any real experience with the work that you do, are they able to understand what it is that you're doing by reading your grant? And if the question, I mean, if the answer is like, hey, Sean, like this sounds good, but I'm kind of confused at 
how you're going to get this, or you mentioned this, but I don't really understand it. You know, that can be so valuable because like I said, when you're close to the stuff, you take for granted jargon, you take for granted acronyms and, um, or, or how do you get from A to B because you do A to B all the time. Um, but having somebody else look at it could be really helpful and you can rotate that. You can have like core people that do that, but that can be a way to, for those people who are like, I can't give you money. All right. Mm -hmm. You can give me your time. Yep. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Fatima. Um, that is a really, really uh, essential point to, to take to heart, right? The people who are around you are the ones that really can help to support, um, elevate your projects and make sure that you are winning the awards or you're not missing the things because, you know, after you've invested, some, your eyes get tired. Um, and so it's great to have a, a diverse set of eyes to look over the things that you miss. And even as someone who reviews grants, who's written grants all the time, I send it um, no less to, to no less than three people, three different people with three different perspectives um, and insights and things. And then as a professor, I always said, I make sure that I read things aloud three times. So I, I go through and I'll read the whole proposal aloud to myself to make sure that I'm not missing um, things or my eyes aren't playing tricks on me. Um, I, I will also say that the, you know, importance of just making sure that you are bringing people to the table, again, reiterating that. I remember when I was helping to develop a um, new name and initiative for a project at the, the organization I was with, and when I was trying to develop the name, I would go around to the employees in the organization and, and test out the different names I was coming up with them. So that way they, mailed, they they were actually invested when we concluded what we wanted to rename um, the project of their initiative. And so they really had a hand in do, doing that. So it made it a lot easier to be able to um, implement. Okay. What's your story? What's your story? What's your organization's story? Who are you? Give me your elevator pitch. 15 seconds. Anyone want to take a bite? Come on. No judgment. It's a judgment. If you don't want to unmute yourself, you can type it in the chat. I really chat. love to hear your voice. Who are you? Who are you? Who's at the table? Come on, come on, someone. I don't want to talk about myself. I have one if no one yeah. goes. Go for it. Is anybody going? Oh, okay. I was like, is anybody going? Hold on one second. I'm going to pull it up. I had to, I did a mentor program and they mm -hmm. had me um, do an elevator pitch and it was so hard y'all uh, <laughs> but here it is okay hold on so my elevator pitch is fms speaks is a consulting and public education agency that helps individuals and businesses create safer environments to have conversations that are traditionally taboo motivating individuals through dialogue workshops and providing the space and tools for self-empowerment for over 10 years fatima has collaborated with over 20 businesses and schools and spoken to over 10,000 people. I love it. That's not only is that the elevator pitch, but she just wrote down or recited the executive summary of any grant project she potentially could write, right? And we're here among community, but at the beginning of this, I said, I managed $2.3 million worth of grants. I'm a funder. Anytime anyone in any space asks you what your story is, you tell them. You should be able to recite that without any thought, right? Because that could be the person that when they leave there, they go back outside or go to the office and pick up the phone and say, hey, I met so-and-so at this conference or at the coffee shop and they were talking about this and I asked them about their elevator pitch of their story and they were able to tell it to me on site. And it's a really compelling narrative. It sounds like a really great organization. Let's investigate this, right? People give away money all the time. Those are how you, that's how you build the connection. So anytime anyone asks you what's your story, what's your elevator pitch, spit it out, right? Because that could be money walking away right there. That's how you should be thinking about this, right? Grant writing is not only when you're sitting down writing the, the proposal itself. Grant writing is any engagement that you're having with individuals about your business in the community. 
right? Again, you're building an intentional investment in your organization and in your business. So you want to make sure that other people are able to, to spread the, the word. I personally don't have a website for my business. And it was very intentional. I did one uh, before. And then when I rebranded and decided to go a different direction with things, I decided not to create a website. And it became a real community thing. So most of my projects and proposals come from people who say, oh, yeah, Sean does that in the community, right? I don't have a website, but I advertise through being able to tell my story, through being able to engage with people through my work. And so they know to refer me to X, Y, and Z when they, you know, someone comes up to them and say, hey, do you know someone who does, right? That's how I generate my business because I have no problem telling um, people with my story. So here we go again. A funder is asking you, what's your story? What's your 15 second elevator pitch? Who are you? Anyone want to take the bait? Throw it out there. What is an executive summary that you've written um, from a grant? So y'all just walking away from money tonight. All right. So we're going to work on that. I'll, I'll go. Okay. Thank you, Misha. Come Yay. on. Oh. So I'm sorry if I'm going on out, but okay. I am, we are, the, I am, we are as a youth empowerment that, um, and I'm, Sorry, my head is not even in this place. Sorry, I am. We are is a youth empowerment organization that is registered in South Africa and Washington D.C. that seeks to um, equip youth with the tools to be able to courageously, uh, confidently pursue their goals. And so, we envision a world where all youth are globally aware, socially responsible, and economically free. I love that. Yeah. I love that. I love it. Can I provide you some feedback? Yes. I want you to cast all doubt out of your elevator pitch. You don't seek to, you are doing it. You don't uh -huh. desire to, you are currently developing, right? Speak in the now, the work that you're doing. You know, one of my friends once told me like, you need to, you need to see that you're already doing the work. The amount of funding, being able to win the proposal does not validate the work that you're doing. You being at the table and doing the work is you validating, right? So remove the doubt. We are, we are doing this thing. We are an organization. These are our skill sets. This is our expertise. And we're doing it in DC and South Africa. And these are the examples of the things that we have done, right? That's how you want to um, sell people. It's a great pitch. And Sean is so right. Like I've worked with many people on that topic and ING, like as in consulting, Mm -hmm. teaching like action words not like we hope to like he said or seek um and if you I know it sounds like you're driving but in the chat I put mine in and if you look it says like motivating individuals not I hope to motivate or I might motivate you um it helps people um realize like like he said that this is action this is active and current yeah, absolutely. And again, you know, think uh, you never know when you are interacting with someone who makes funding. So if you're you know saying to me you're seeking that that tells me okay, you got a little ways to go before I decide I want to invest my money in this venture, right? If you tell me you're already doing it, my next question is, okay, what evidence do you have of that? Like show me show me the project because now I'm intrigued, right? If you come to the table with doubt, I'm going to be uncertain as to whether or not I want to invest my money in that, right? So remove all doubt. And that's a, I think that's a cultural thing as well. We like to see bright lights and, and big checks before we think we are accomplishing things, but making the effort itself is the accomplishment, right? So um, make sure that you are, are celebrating those small wins as well. So you were awarded the money. You got the money. You won the proposal. You sold them on your elevator pitch. What's next? What do you do after you win the award? This is like they've given you the award agreement, you sign on the dotted line, and all you have to do now is start spending the money. The first thing that I want you to do anytime that you get a grant award is to have a meeting with the people who are written in the project. An organization or institution I work with that shall not be named, 
wrote a six-figure project for grant federal award they got the project i was working as a consultant on the project trying to get things off the ground when i went around to the department heads or individuals who were um, written into the grant they had no knowledge the grant existed great can't do the work now because now i have to do capacity building and work backwards and um, convince them that this is a good project and, and these are the things that we need to do, right? So I'm already at a disadvantage because I, I no longer, I don't have the support and the capacity um, to be able to implement the project. So I'm losing time, which then looks bad because I have to report those things um, to the government or whomever the funder is at that point in time. And they're saying, okay, if you don't have the capacity and you can't manage these dollars, then we're gonna take the rest away or we're not going to fund you, you know, next year, right? And those are the things that you don't want to do. So the first thing you should do, anybody who's involved in the project, and I normally suggest to my grantees 20% or more. If you've written that person in for 20% or more of the work, then they need to know at least what's going on with the, ad, uh, with the project. Don't hide budgets, right? I know we get money for the organizations. We're in leadership positions. We're in position of powers, and we like to think that the money is ours. Don't do that. Right. The, the people you're working with, again, should be know should know where the money is coming from. We're talking about full transparency and accountability. You're trying to build trust. You're trying to build relationships. You're trying to demonstrate expertise um, and experience with carrying out the project. So that way you can get more money. So make sure that you are letting individuals who are involved in this project, whether it be community, if you have to. Um, provide like do listening sessions I both before and after you get the award to let the the um let the populations know what it is they're funding right a lot of people come into spaces especially I think like healthcare clin clinics and they want access to certain services and those clinics are grant bound but the patients don't know that because the clinics don't provide um, information to the community about how the funding is distributed. Those are very critical pieces to know. Um, make sure that you're considering your employees. If you, if something happens, for example, COVID, right? I always tell people have a crisis plan in place. If you were in the communications training, make sure you have a crisis plan um, in place for if something happens and you have to cease operations, how are you gonna to continue to expend the money? What's gonna happen? Are you gonna be in a funder that's gonna provide an automatic extension? Those are questions that you need to ask yourself and that should be in the crisis plan, right? Make sure that you are preparing for um, worst case scenario. Uh, so everyone who is involved already knows what's going on, right? They know the pieces that they need to move to ensure that the, the projects don't stop. And then finally, bring other people to the table, right? Like Fatima was saying, if you need any type of review, your family members, friends, people that you trust, um, you know, make sure that you are bringing other organizations to the table, other small business owners who are looking, let them go through the process with you. If you are doing a review from an award that you didn't get, invite them to the, the award review so they know how that works, so they know what the mistakes are, right? If we're trying to be in it, if we're, if our desire is to exist in the space where we are providing, you know, support, love, and care to one another, that is one of the easiest places for us to do that is to invite people in um, when we are navigating these challenges and they're also trying to get off the ground. I, I talked to plenty of uh, minority organizations and, and businesses and uh, nonprofit leaders. And the number one thing they always say is I have a challenge finding people who look like us to help evaluate our programs, to help with grant writing, to help with strategic planning, right? And these people do exist, but what happens is everything is in a silo. We start to hoard things because I have this information, then that person um, shouldn't have that information as well. And that's really not how we solve anything. And I don't know about y'all, but I don't want to work for the rest of my life. So if we band together in a collaborative space, um, and leverage our resources together, we really can in um, some of the, the more atrocious human experiences that we have to navigate and that we're often looking to get funded so we can prevent, right? And that's it.
Um, we definitely were not going to go into the full two hours, but I would love a Q&A if anybody has any questions, any insights, again, projects, um, anything that you would like to see in terms of one-on-one, I'm more than happy if you um, email me or email Fatima if you want to set up one-on-one, if you are working on grant projects or proposals, by all means, let me know. I'm more than happy if you give me, um, you know, enough time to, to review the proposals to provide you with feedback. Um, and then I'm going to start trying to do some type of weekly list of resources to put in the listserv that the capacity building listserv that uh, Fatima and, three, and Collective 365 has developed so that one, everyone has access to resources. And then if you have specific questions on things, um, you can reach out to me and I'm, I'm trying to compile a list that's going to include communications resources, strategic planning resources, and also websites and places for you to be able to um, find grants and any type of um, contracts and things. That may be around the first of the year. People are just going into um, the first quarter of new grant cycles. So around the first of the year sometimes. Sean, okay. yep. can I um, push you a little more to define, give me more time? Um, you're being gracious by offering one-on-one -on -one consultation, but um, some people think time is like 24 hours. I would say at least two weeks, but if you could define for the people listening and yeah, yeah. watching later, what, what leeway you need. Sure. So feel free at any point in time, if you have questions about proposals or anything to email me in terms of resources, um, what are we in October? I'm thinking somewhere like mid November, I should have a good resource list compiled. Um, and only because I'm compiling it for a variety of, of people and projects. So I'm going to just do one big list and send it out to everyone um, who's been requesting those types of resources. Um, so, yeah, I would say somewhere around mid-November, January. Sorry, one I, I wasn't clear. I mean, because you said if people have questions oh, or, want, or want you to like review a certain section of their grant, how much time should they get? Like, do you want people to send that to you like? two weeks and that'll be enough time for you to put it in your queue or are you like awesome. hey I if you give me two weeks I'm happy to give you free 30 minute consultation just so that people understand the parameters absolutely so I would say at least two weeks two weeks and I um I would say an hour consultation because that's a at least an hour um that way it'll give you give me time to sort of give you the feedback and then if you have any questions and again my my schedule fluctuates a little bit so sometimes I have a little bit more time um, than others I'm actually going into a slow season so some time is going to open up but if you literally just email me and we can work it out and figure it out and my sleeping schedule is all over the place so it's not uncommon that I would get back to you at 3 30 in the morning before we jump into questions, I just want to say on behalf of Collective 365, we are glad to have you as a member. We are glad that you are sharing this knowledge. And like you said, helping us um, debunk this idea that we all have to kind of hoard knowledge and resources. Um, there is enough for all of us to get fed. And so thank you. Thank you, Sean, um, for helping us um, get what we should have. Um, and I hope that you all will share this with at least five people, whether that is sharing the notes you may have took or some takeaways or just sharing the link. I will be emailing you all the link to this. Um, it'll be posted on YouTube and anybody can watch it. Um, so thank you, Sean. Thank you for those that are attending. And we're, we're excited to support you. Um, so I'm going to open it up like, the floor to Sean for, for questions. And if you don't have any questions, feel free to hop off. Yeah, if you don't have any questions, thank you all for coming. Feel free to email me. Um, if you do have questions, throw them at me. Awesome. I'm going to stop the recording since it seems like folks don't have questions.